So Trump is running for president in 2024. Who is surprised by this? Anyone? I seriously doubt it. Another thing that absolutely no one should be surprised about is the way instantaneously the media and the UNA party have started to try to gin up this fake war within the Republican Party, the never Trumpers versus the Trumpers. I think that they're way overplaying their hand, but the problem is too many on our side are falling for it. So I'd like to touch on that a little bit, as well as a few other topics. So why don't you join me as we have another hazardous conversation. Trigger warning disclaimer. Hazardous Conversations pushes rhetorical boundaries for acceptable political discourse. Listening to this program could have the uncomfortable side effect of provoking deep intellectual inquiry into foundational principles of liberty. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, so Trump's going to run for president again in 2024. This is not a surprise. We know this. But have you noticed that they've already started to poke and jab and prod and throw out little stories here and there about how, no, Republicans don't want Donald Trump. And majority of Republicans say they want someone with a more even... They're setting up all this nonsense. Now, it's not complete nonsense, I will, I will grant. There are a good number of people, myself included, that wishes President Trump were a little bit different from who he is. We covered this in the last episode a little bit. But the fact of the matter is, he's not. And the fact of the matter is, the way that he is allowed him to get a lot of the positive things done that he got done while he was in office. And I do believe that he would get more positive things done if reelected. Now, announcing this early is a brilliant strategy because it automatically does put him as the front runner, whether you like that or not. At this point, anyone else who gets in the race on the Republican side is going to be framed as being against Donald Trump. Not against the Dems, not against anything else. They're going to be against Donald Trump. Trump's going to frame it that way, and the media's going to frame it that way, and the supporters of whoever this other person is is going to frame it that way. The person themselves might actually come out and say, no, I am not against Trump. I just have a different idea of how to do things. But they're going to be against Trump. This may work. This may not work. But the other side of that, the other thing that it's going to accomplish is that it's going to expose for Trump all the would-be saboteurs, all the people that would hem and haw that he doesn't want to have an administration around him. Because these are the same people that are going to be leaking stuff to the media. These are the same people who are going to get disgruntled and, and run off and say, well, I, I never agreed with Donald Trump in the first place. They're going to suck up to him. If he's the nominee, they're going to suck up to him and try to jockey for a place within his administration. And then they're going to stab him in the back. And Trump needs to know who these people are right now. Because if he doesn't identify them now, then he's going to end up with at least the first year or two years of his administration, if he wins. Kind of the same way that he ended up in 2016, where he's got a bunch of backstabbers and he's got to wade through all the nonsense. Now... Some people have said, I wish Trump and DeSantis would team up. At the moment, that's not possible. They're residents of the same state. By constitutional provision, you cannot be residents of the same state to be president and vice president. That's just, that's the way it is. Now, that's not hard to overcome. All Trump would have to do is change his residency back to New York or anywhere else that he has a house or he buys a house and establishes residency there. It's been done time and time again. Liz Cheney did that in Wyoming. And while we don't necessarily applaud such things, if that's really what we want, it's easy for them to do. Now that kind of sort of brings up another interesting thing that's been on my mind. If it's what we want, if it's what the voters want, should they listen? Here's the thing. I don't know that we know what the heck we want sometimes. During my time being part of the party, 
And even still, I hear over and over again, inside and out, we need unity. We need unity. We need unity. We need to come together and back a single candidate, especially coming from Washington where it's an open primary. The fact that we can have 200 people in the race splits it and divides us and then we never come together. And there's a lot to be said for that. We are so freaking opinionated on our side. We are so independent that we take this attitude of my guy is the best guy. And if you don't back my guy, I'm not going to back your guy. Or if my guy loses, I'm not going to back your guy because I'm a sore loser because my guy was the best guy and you didn't support him. And yes, I mean guy or gal. We do this all the time while at the same time saying we need to unite, we need to unite, we need to unite. So it just strikes me funny that now we have this situation where we have a candidate. We have a Republican president, not presidential candidate, a Republican president who is stepping out on the stage and saying, I'm going to do this again. And by making that announcement and making that filing, he's just now opened himself up to all of the regulations that go along with federal campaign financing and all that nonsense. So he's got to start keeping track of all that stuff, subjugated to all the limitations that go along with it, all the scrutiny that goes along with it. And he's doing that a full two years in advance. And the first thing that we do is say, oh, well, we can't unite behind him. Two years ago, we united behind him. Yes, he lost, but we all know why he lost. It wasn't because of votes, or it wasn't because of legitimate votes. Are we really saying that out of one side of our mouth, we need to unite, we need to unite, we need to unite, and out of this other side of our mouth, we're saying, yeah, but not him. Because that's what some of you are saying. That's what some people are tweeting out and posting on Facebook and on my page on Facebook are commenting in response that you can support anybody other than Trump. And I've tried to make it clear as I possibly can. I am not advocating for Trump per se. Not yet. Because there's a long primary cycle And I don't know who else is going to get, and I don't know what else is going to come up, but I've got no reason to not support Trump. All of his flaws intact. I've got no good logical reason to not support him, especially in opposition to the left. And that's some of the most ridiculous, stupid commentary that I've seen from people like Alex Berenson, I've seen a few other places, of people saying that if Trump is the nominee on the Republican side, they're either not going to vote or they're going to actually vote for a Democrat. How stupid is that? You're saying you're going to vote for making things worse rather than taking a chance again on somebody who already was objectively better. You just don't like the way he does it. And that, my friends, is hypocrisy, and it is double-mindedness, and it is antithetical to a true conservative mindset. Now, I'm not saying Trump is a true conservative, not by a long shot. There's many things that he's done wrong, bad, wrong-headed. He supported spending out the wazoo. But what did he support spending on? He supported spending on things that is a proper role and function of government to spend money on. Stuff like border security, stuff like the military. Now we can argue about the amounts, but darn it, he was at least spending it on programs and things that is a proper function of federal government. A couple other areas where he's just dead wrong. The bump stock ban, dead wrong. I, I, he says he supports red flag laws. I don't know if he's moderated that position or not, but he's dead wrong on that. He was dead wrong on the COVID response. Now I'm going to be a little bit forgiving to him in the way that that was sprung on him and what was going on. I honestly believe he was a caring, heartfelt man who was being told over and over again, millions of Americans are going to die if you don't do this. And what did he do? Did he lock down the country? No. He said it's not the federal government's responsibility to do it. And he left it up to the states. Did he intervene the way we would have liked? No. But again, is that wrong of him? Showing federal restraint on a federal question? You want to fault him for that? I'm not so quick to. The thing that I fault him the most on COVID is his unqualified and stupid idiotic belief 
in the jab and pushing that and still pushing that. I mean, I he's not really pushing it right now. Or at least I haven't heard him push it in a while. But he hasn't apologized for it, and I don't expect he ever will. But outside of that, and outside of the, the pettiness that he gets involved with from time to time and exudes, what is your argument against Trump as far as a president? Not as far as a political calculation and what you think is going to happen in the election, because I'll tell you what, none of us have an idea of what's going to happen in two years on the political side on the election. What is wrong with the man? And what would be wrong with him being in that office again? Now, changing topics just a little bit. One idea that he did propose that I really have come to embrace, I used to be opposed to it, but I have, I have come to conclude that it is necessary. Term limits. I am for term limits. Now, I don't know that I have a preferred method, and I'm not going to tell you what I think the term limits should be. Senators, you get a six-year term. Two terms for a, a senator is 12 years. If you can't get stuff done in 12 years, you shouldn't be there. And quite frankly, you shouldn't be there longer than 12 years anyway. For Congress, three terms, six years. I don't know if, if that's fair. Uh, you, you get there and you get good enough or good at it just in time to, to stop being there. I don't know. One idea that I do like with term limits is instead of making it uh, an overall term limit, make it a consecutive term limit of if you're a senator, you can't serve more than two consecutive terms, but then you take a break for a term and you can come back and be reelected for another two consecutive terms. What that would do is create forced turnover, forced attrition. Now, this is one of the arguments against term limits is the idea that you're taking away that choice from the people. You're taking away my liberty to vote for somebody that I want to keep sending back to Washington or to the state house or wherever it is. Now, again, I used to be of that mindset. However, I cannot place it on the scales of my my limited liberty in that. And I say limited because it presumes that I have a person that's worth reelecting which is far more the exception than the rule these days. And it assumes that everyone has that choice. And that if you place that on the one side of the scales, and on the other side of the scale, you, you place the amount of abuse that has gone on for so long on that side, on that branch of government, those two things don't balance. And I would gladly surrender that very limited liberty. And I, it's, it's a limited liberty. I'm not being denied the ability to choose who I want. I'm just having one of those choices temporarily removed from me. And it's fundamentally no different than if the person decides to retire because they're now taking that choice away from me too. Or if they uh, get arrested or if they die. You know, that's just as much taking that ability for me to choose that person again away from me as term limits does. So the two things don't balance the corruption and abuses that have happened because people have become career politicians has to stop. And the only way that I can see of effectively having even a chance to stop it is by preventing those people from sitting there fat, dumb and happy for the rest of their lives. Like some of them have. I think McConnell is going on 36 years in the Senate, or he will be at 36 years at the end of this term, I think, or 30 years. Too damn long. And we need to put a curb on that. So I think every single Republican party throughout the country needs to, at your county level, your state level, and at the national level, you need to start pushing and passing resolutions supporting a constitutional amendment for term limits. Absolutely needs to happen. And don't tell me that it can't happen. It absolutely can. It can happen at the county level easily. And it can happen at the state level in most states where Republicans have a decent Republican Party. Don't tell me that it can't. It absolutely can. It'll probably take a little while to get it done at the national level. Probably have to wait till the convention in 2024. But we can't wait until 2024 to start laying that groundwork. You start passing it as part of your county and your state parties right now, and you start cultivating people to be nominees 
to be delegates, to get elected, to go to the National Convention in 2024, where they will adopt the new platform that will have that in there. That's another big problem that our side has, is that we we complain and we moan about the party doesn't do this, the party doesn't do that, and how many of us actually take the time to get involved with the party? I'm not talking about campaign. I'm not talking about doorbelling. I'm talking about going out, become a PCO or a committee man, whatever they call it in your state, at your local level, your most local basic level. Get yourself either appointed or elected as an official part of the Republican Party at your local level Go to your county party, start forming it, start shaping it the way that you want it to be. If you don't like the way that it is, get in there, get involved, and start working. If you won't do the work, you don't get to complain about the people who are doing the work. Now, will a constitutional amendment actually pass? It can. It's not impossible. It's not this impossible thing that everyone likes to think that it is. It does require us electing the right people to support it, to get it passed, and it requires a lot of groundwork to get the support behind it. And whenever that conversation comes up, inevitably it brings up, well, we can never get people elected. It's rigged. You know, until we fix our election laws, we have no chance to win. Okay, that's a really great defeatist attitude to take, and you can sit in that pile of steaming dung and just feel sorry for yourself. At some point, we have to figure out how to beat the rigging. If they're ballot harvesting, we need to be ballot harvesting. Now, that's not going to solve all the problem, but it could solve a lot. Places that have mail-in balloting, there's very little that we can do to counteract the ways that they manipulate that other than get involved with your county auditors. How many of you have actually volunteered at your county auditor on election night to help count the votes, to help monitor counting the votes, to help cure ballots uh, where they do ballot curing? How many of you have volunteered to be those foot soldiers on election night, making sure that things are going the way that they're supposed to be going? Again, if you don't do the work, you don't get to complain about the people who are doing the work. If you won't take the initiative to get involved, then nothing can change. I know it's an uphill battle. I know it's depressing to keep uh, fighting and fighting and feel like we're not making any headway. In many ways, I... <laughs> shared this on Facebook, uh, commented on somebody else's post, that I, I realized that being a Republican in, in places like Washington, it's like being a Lions fan, Detroit Lions. You know, year after year, you think you, you think you got a great team, you finally get a, a good recruit or a good trade, and you're like, oh, yeah, I know, we're going to, things are going to turn around, we've got such high hopes. And then the management and the coaching staff screw you over and you get the snot kicked out of you. And at a certain point, even though you're a diehard fan, even though you're very loyal to the brand, you start to say, why am I doing this to myself? You don't want to root for another team, but you don't want to keep participating in that masochistic exercise of of supporting a system, supporting a franchise, a brand that seems intent on losing no matter what they do. So yes, in many places, elections are rigged. But the only way that we're going to be able to overcome it, the only way we're going to be able to do anything about it, is if we start playing the game as it's set, not simply complaining about the rigging of the game. I think I'm going to end it there. I got some other topics that uh, I'm going to be recording uh, episodes on coming up very shortly but i think this is a a good ending place for this episode so like it rate it comment follow subscribe and most importantly share it with anyone that you think might like it also so until next time god be with you all in all that you do and remember keep the faith and keep up the fight